Welcome, we're going to get started. My name is Saskia. Like I said earlier, I'm the founder of the Institute for Art and Olfaction, which is a nonprofit based here in Los Angeles devoted to experimentation and access with the field of perfume. Um, this series is called the Meet a Nose series, and we use the term nose a little bit ironically because everybody has a nose. It's just that some of us use it a little bit more than others. Uh, for this latest edition of Meet a Nose, I'm super thrilled to welcome Sarah and Ron. So Sarah horowitz tron has been creating perfume for about 30 years and is known as one of the pioneers of indie perfumery. Uh, her fragrances are worn and loved by many, including celebrities, stylists, and media personalities, and have been on the shelves of world-class retailers such as Barney's New York, Anthropology, Nordstrom, and of course, Ron Robinson. Uh, for his part, Ron, uh, in 1978, Ron Robinson opened the doors to his eponymous shop on Melrose Avenue in LA. Since then, his stores have grown, continually changing the face of shopping and fashion, fueling the Los Angeles beauty world with hard-to-find labels, lifestyle objects, design, and of course, perfume. Five years after launching the shop, Ron Robinson Inc. expanded its offerings with a beauty boutique that Ron named Apothea, which is a portmanteau for the words apothecary and utopia. Robinson's desire to cultivate shopping experiences with key lifestyle and design items, the fashion you live with, in other words, created a, a program, a company called Style Objects. So I'm gonna leave it at that and let them take it away. Um, Ron? Well, thank you, Saskia. Saskia, we, we, you, you, you didn't mention that we met in Milan about a year and a half ago. Uh, maybe it was two years, pre-COVID and, and having a good time at a panel there. Yeah, when we were allowed to visit each other and travel. And, and thanks for this opportunity. And, and my dear friend, Sarah Horowitz, who I've known for now, I guess it's 30 years. It's at least 30, 31 years, something 1990, like. I, 1994, Ron, is when I met you. Yeah. My first job in California when I moved here was working at Apothea with for Ron with Ron but for Ron he was absolutely the boss I don't know I don't know if that's so I, 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 I debate that whether you worked for me or I worked for you <laughs> uh, from time to time it, the, the, the roles changed quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, Sarah is very headstrong and you're, you're fantastic and I it's, it's amazing that I can have the opportunity, and thank you for the, this opportunity to talk to you, having, having met you 30 years ago, and, and, and as an employee of, a, of my shop, and the, the history that we've carried on to this point, because it's, there, there's a great deal of things that we've done together, which is, I'm, I'm eager to, to dive into with you. Uh, but I'd like to I'd like to just tell everybody how it all started. Sarah walked into my store in 1994, and she said, "I'm a perfumer from Boston, from Massachusetts." And and I got to tell you, she walked into a, a Los Angeles Hollywood store where everybody who looks for a job walks in and says, "I'm an actress, and I'm the best, you know, the best thing that you know ever happened." And I took it with a grain of salt. But boy, did she fulfill everything she ever said. And she came with a, with a little box. And, and that box was her, her, her toolbox of scents. And told me that she has made custom fragrance for people. And uh, could she do that in my store as well? I'm going to let her tell you her side of the story, because I'm sure there's many things that that she she has uh, has done, but I just want to I just want to preface it. Here's a young girl walking into a, a, a high end shop, and to this day, she is one of the foremost amazing business people and perfumers in this industry, and that's what's really very amazing about Sarah Horowitz. She's able to balance. Uh, the very important part of business with perfumery so that she can carry this on and I'm going to let her tell you about that but um, we have we have a history together of making perfume together uh, watching families grow up together I'm so proud to be able to to talk with you Sarah in this format thank you for asking me and uh, 
first of all, I think you should just uh, uh, let let them know if I if I just framed the beginning part of that correctly <laughs> as you saw it. <laughs> well, first of all, for those of you who don't know me, just be prepared for my. I'm I'm already emotional here. Um, Ron, I'm so grateful that you are agreed to uh, to do this interview with me today because you are um, you were the first point of contact when I moved to Los Angeles, and uh, you got you got it right. Uh, but hearing it from your perspective is I can't tell you what it means to me to hear your side of that experience because. When I moved to California, um, I was originally from New York and went to school in Boston. I had a store, uh, I walked into a store in Boston when I was uh, there for college, I went to Emerson. And there was a perfumery on Newbury Street that did custom fragrances. And when I walked in there the first time, uh, you know, I, for those of you who don't remember the late 80s, but I could just say there were crystals, Anya was playing in the background, and I saw a wall of oils and a man said to me, may I anoint you? And, um, and I thought, I, I said, I don't know what that is, but <laughs> sure, you could do that. And he said, well, you're so unique, shouldn't your fragrance be? And um, I've said this before, but, and it sounds cliche, but it was literally my life before that moment and my life after that moment. I fell in love with the idea of perfumery, um, but moreover, uh, and this will bring us to, to where we are right in this moment on this Zoom call. The thing that spoke to me most passionately, most powerfully about perfumery was really, it was just a byproduct to connect with other people. Uh, the reason that I fell in love with customization was because it gave me a perfect excuse to sit down with a total stranger and say to them, who are you? What makes you who you are and what do you love? And work with them with the fragrances being the bridge. Um, as only a very young person does, I thought I pretty much knew it all by the time I, you know, I, I worked there through college, I read everything I could about perfumery, I developed my own technique, and then uh, when I was graduating college in 92, the man that owned it decided he wanted to close and sell, and so I, I saved money. My parents, who are on this call right now, um, lent me money, and I bought the business from him when I was 22 years old with another girl who worked there. Um, and I ran it for two years. I knew nothing about business. The idea of, of buying a business was literally, oh, if I do this, I could keep my job and keep doing what I loved. Uh, after two more years in Boston, it was, I just was done. It was freezing for any of you who lived on the East Coast or have experienced a Boston winter, you'll know what I mean. And I, I, was, I always knew I wanted to move to California. And um, with my parents, support and love, I packed up my Volkswagen and moved to California. I drove across country with the toolbox from Sears filled with essential and fragrance oils. And once I got to LA, all I heard was Apothea at Fred Siegel, Apothea Fred Siegel, you have to go, you have to go. I had never heard of it. I didn't know what it was. Thank God I did not know what it was because if had I known walking in, I don't know if I would have been quite as uh, as Ron may remember, self-assured in that moment. But I did make an appointment to uh, work, go there because I knew it was the place. It was on Melrose Avenue, Melrose and Crescent Heights. And I walked in, I had an appointment to meet with Ron. I brought my toolbox and I, exactly, I introduced myself. <laughs> I think of it now too, because of course I, I um, even when you say, even now, like, and I've been doing it for so long, but then, you know, saying I'm a perfumer, there's a part of you in your brain that's like, am I? I never did, custom, you know, I never did formal training, but I owned that moment of, I knew what I could do as far as that experience. And Ron listened to me. He humored me um, and he let me talk to him about how he should give me 300 square feet of his shop because I'll do custom blends. And I would charge maybe even a hundred dollars, which he was like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Look, look, I recall, I recall that, Sarah. But when you came in, you said I make custom fragrances and and, and I, I hired you and it was it was, well, can I just approach your customers and make a custom fragrance for them? 
And I thought, well, this this girl's got a lot of chutzpah. I mean, shop we're selling our product, and all of a sudden she's gonna she's gonna take the business. I said, you can as long as you're you're discreet and you know talk to me about it. I needed to learn it. We have a lot of celebrities that came in the store, um, and uh, it was it was it was really marvelous. So I. I catch Sarah every once in a while. I'd come into the store and I'd see her out in the parking lot <laughs> because she didn't want she didn't want to our 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 entryway faces our parking lot so you can see everything happening. It's a big scene uh, watching all the cars come up and the people coming into the store and who's who's around there. And and Sarah's out in one of the cars with one of the one of the customers because she didn't want to interfere in the in the job inside but she was making contacts and making fragrance for for somebody out in the car in the parking lot um i remember it, it that i remember that very very well there was, we, we we talked about that at the time as i recall but i have to say what the best thing uh with I, I always tell people to this day that working at Apothea, uh, working with Ron, with the brands that he had cultivated there, um, was the single best education I could have ever gotten in regards to independent perfumery. Because I knew, all I knew was what I saw at the mall, or what I saw at Macy's or Nordstrom. I don't even think Nordstrom at the time. I mean, I was young. I, I didn't know about uh, like the niche or artisan community. And Ron had an amazing eye and an amazing buyer and they had Lardizan. Uh, you had a Nikutal. Do you remember a Nikutal? Sure. Uh, you had a, um, a Nikutal, of course, but Antonius Flowers. You had Antonius Flowers. You had a couple of these amazing niche brands or I, we, I say niche, but yeah, well, niche or more work. independent high-end brands I had never it never even crossed my mind and I learned so much of the possibility of the niche and independent world that didn't have to be the mass market and so when I started crafting fragrances for individualized I sort of incorporated that knowledge of the branding and the packaging and what people were open to with what I really learned working at Apothea. Look we we tried when we opened the, the first shop of, of Apothea it was it was an it was a love of mine. I'm not you know it, Saskia, you use the word nose, and I'm I I I relate the nose the word nose at, to, as a perfumer, a professional. Um, I mean I, the relationship I have with a nose is what I'm wearing between my eyes, and that, that, that's but I'm and I'm not a trained professional as Sarah is, but I love. I love stents and I love the product and I love the packaging and I loved all of that. And that's where, that was the part of it that helped me open the shop because it was, it was something that was really needed. Um, at that time, there was no, as Sarah said, you could only get uh, perfume, fragrance uh, for men or for women, either at a main floor department store or you could go to a, uh, a few, a few women's or men's stores might have had something on the counter. You could go to a drug store, um, or maybe a, 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 a beauty supply store, but that was it. So it was, it was a very limited option, and and we were used to serving our customer in a very boutique setting. And I brought together male and female to shop together in an environment of buying skincare, hair care, fragrance. Mm -hmm. And um, we tried at the beginning to bring in the major brands. It was, it was, I was unknown where we would go with this. And the customer didn't need us at all for that. They wanted us to find these unique and small brands, people who were uh, as, as uh, Antonia's Flowers in, in, in New York uh, making her product. And, all of these interesting brands from around the world that they couldn't get their hands on. So that was our, that, that was our, that was our program. That was our niche approach to how, and it worked really well. Um, uh, it, 
we, we should uh, go on. I'd yeah. like to because because uh, Sarah, how long were you? How long did we work together in that capacity? And then you went off and did your own thing. Well, I worked. So while I worked with you at 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 Apothea, I worked part time. Um, and I remember when I first came in, I said you could, I could have some. You know, I could work and create a blending bar at your store. And you said, why don't you? as my fragrance expert and um you know I and you i were, worked by the way i knew you were working part-time but i thought we were paying you for full-time I, I was i was always <laughs> it was part-time because the other days no, I'm kidding. when i wasn't as <laughs> <laughs> when i when i wasn't at apothea i was basically walking with my toolbox on a little rolly thing anywhere they would let me so i would walk i went down to the beach communities and i would i did worked farmers markets i worked pretty much i would literally walk go to like any high-end street that i could with my rolly thing and I'd walk into a store and just say to the people that work there i make custom fragrances can i make you a custom fragrance today and when i before i had left boston our store was on Newbury Street, and it's a very well-traveled street with um, people that, you know, tourists that walk, walked in. So I knew I was moving about six months prior to my move, maybe a little bit less than that. And I started making a collection of phone numbers and even email, though but at that time it was pretty much AOL only. But I started collecting uh, phone numbers and addresses of people that came in from California. So once I got to LA, I, and before I moved to LA, I got a Los Angeles phone number. Um, so that way I could have business cards printed with an LA phone number that I could start handing just before I moved. So I had a little collection where I could do an email, not an email blast, but um, postcards, like physical mailers. So I started trying to cultivate clients before I even got to LA. And then once I started working with you on the weekends or on any day off, I would set my little table wherever people would let me and offer to blend fragrances and started collecting um, basically a mailing list from that. Uh, and then how that evolved was I, I worked with you for a year and then I don't know if you know this, but someone came in and offered me a job down in Malibu while I was working in Apothea, <laughs> sorry, um, from Planet Blue actually. And so I started working, I moved to Malibu and I started working in Malibu and um, working at their essential shop, also part-time. And they would let me on the weekends, on Saturdays, I could set up a table out front of the store and I'd have all my oil set out and I would start doing custom fragrances. And that was that, you know, people on Cross Creek coming in and out um, would be, you know, that's how I would start making the fragrances. And one day, Two things happened through Planet Blue. One was um, I had been working on a gardenia scent. And for any of you who are perfumers or interested in perfumery, you know that gardenia is an extremely elusive. Um, it, it does not yield an essential oil. So any fragrance pretty much that says it has gardenia in it is a creation by a perfumer. Um, generally synthetic, um, sometimes cultivated with some natural materials, jasmine, ketone, et cetera. But I had been working on a gardenia for a long time because it's extremely emotional. A lot of people request it in the custom fragrance experience. It's, it's one of the most amazing fl flowers as far as olfactively. And I created a fragrance for a woman uh, in the store who had, a, or outside the store, and she freaked out and talked about it. And the owner of that store said, whatever that is, can you make a bottle and sell it here? And I said, oh, well, you know, that's her custom blend. I could never, but I could do my own variation. And that's how Perfect Gardenia came about. You know, I had already sw always sworn I would never have a ready to wear collection because I wanted to be true to the only customization because fragrance is so unique and personal and subjective. And really I loved the interaction. I loved the, the journey process of going deep with people. But uh, then, you know, someone offered to pay me to do that. So I that always, made a few models and put it in her store. It always sort of helps. Um, yes. I, I want to just, I don't want to spend too much on it, but I, I do want to let everybody know you were charging at that time a great deal of money for this personalization. It was yes. more than, it was more than a bottle of fragrance cost at the time. 
and I know that when you were out in the parking lot, you lassoed a couple of celebrities. Yes, I remember it, Ron, because I believe we're actually Who telling you, the story. You, you fired you make me, a and story? then you rehired me. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> Who did you make a fragrance for? <laughs> uh, it was Patricia Arquette. Yeah, and but the. There were, uh, there were many others that you were in contact with. It was terrific. It really and did. I mean, it changed. And I got, you. I built my mailing, you know, I built a mailing list from your clients. Thank you so much. <laughs> if I haven't said thank you in the last 30 years. Thank you. Well, and, and uh, you're welcome. And I thank you as well. Uh, so <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned Gardenia because one of the next steps that you and I took together was I came up with this idea. Um, this was in, you, you came in 1994, in 1998, uh, 1998, I went on the internet. And, and I, it was a time where there, there wasn't social media, there was just- uh, um, Websites. It, it, it was it was a websites, but people didn't have a business model that they was working. It was just starting. There were things going up on the web and going down, but it was the cool thing to do to have a website address. And I thought, okay, fine. I'm you know I'm I'm we have a cool shop. I got to have a website address, and we did. And I didn't have a clue. I said it would be really nice if we could just you know, have this and we put something up and somebody bought something, it'd be so much easier than running a store. It was a very naive approach at the time. It was the only approach that I had, but it so happened that we sold a great deal of fragrance because we had a, 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 a an exclusive on, <laughs> on a certain fragrance because I, I adopted this this one perfumer who came in and said she's making it in her back room and sell it. Um, it wasn't me. It was another one. <laughs> I, I, I do this often. <laughs> but no one, but no one as long and, and fruitful a relationship as with you. But here's here's the here's the, the beginning of this story is that we sold a lot of it because of a, of, of a magazine article. And it was very beneficial that we had a website because we could tell people to go to it and, and buy it. And I was sure at the time, who the hell is gonna buy fragrance online for a fragrance you've never heard of? I'm gonna, if I sell a hundred bottles, I'm gonna get 99 back. I'm sure they're gonna get it. It's not <laughs> gonna work. And I did, we did. So I was driving home when, one afternoon and I thought, my gosh, I have this, this customer base that bought fragrance from me across the United States. At some point, they're gonna wanna change fragrance. How do I keep them? What do I do? And I came up with an idea that I was going to uh, uh, connect with them and create a fragrance in house using a communication with them. There was no social media, but I wrote an email to each one of them saying, how would you like to be part of a group that helps us create a signature fragrance for our, for our store? And, and I called Sarah and I said, here's what I'm doing. Would you be the perfumer on this? Would you bring you know, the technical skills and your, and your talent and we will do this together. And, and thank goodness she thought it was a, a, a good idea. And we created this team. It was you and it was a fellow Aaron. named Andy Ehrlich, a doctor, uh, Andy Ehrlich, who is a, a clinical psychologist who I've known since I was three years old. And he helped us write correct um, questions so that they didn't uh, drive a, an answer. They were, they were pure answers. Um, but Sarah was the, the perfumer on that. The final fragrance is called If, and we launched it in 2001. 
It took almost eight months to go through the development of it with a hundred people and we didn't lose a single one. When we did this, what we did was we, I worked with your, I, I was his name, Ian, what we worked, we created the questionnaire Andy. and then I created five different fragrances in the, in five different genres. So I created a floral, a fruity, a shipra, um, and a very clean scent. And so with that, we sent them multiple packages, but basically we had the, the customer feedback where they sampled the fragrances and then they were able to choose their out of the five, which were their top two. And if they were to do anything, what would they do? And then I would take all of that information and then say, okay, these were the most requested, most genres. And these were the most loved notes and most requested of what we could do. And we created another set of you know, we kept creating fragrances based on the feedback and sent multiple rounds, as I recall, filling all those little sample vials and sending them in packages. So the final formula that we still handcraft today, actually, for IF, um, is literally created by the feedback of this one. It was like a very intimate process between our creative team, myself as the perfumer, and the the clients that were experiencing the fragrances, they were a part of it every step of the way. They smelled each iteration, they voted on it, they were allowed to make comments. So there's been an evolution in our process of working together and Ron has a, a much larger collection now, if was the first. But that specific fragrance I know still is one of your best selling, I think it's your best selling fragrance. It is our best selling fragrance and we have a very broad, broad spectrum of, of ancillaries that go with it now. And I, I, I said to you, you were at the time you were able to, to, to do the creation of the fragrance, but when we wanted to, you yeah, the scale that we wanted to go to after a while was beyond where you were at. And I said, I'm not taking it out of Sarah's house where she's going to make the oil forever and and you are we, we had to go to to others to make some of the ancillary so we could we could scale it um some of the big houses really jivadon uh took yeah took your fragrance and helped us make it for others but we're we're still going to sarah conti consistently which um, you said our my house and i just want to be clear for at least the first decade, it was literally being made <laughs> at the place where I lived. Just, just to clarify, it's no longer in my house, although it is the house, you know, I, I, I'm more here more than my house, but yeah, for a long time, it was literally out of my house. Oh, and you had that wonderful, wonderful, did you, you didn't live on that top place in Malibu, yeah. did that was your house too? Yeah, well, I mean, oh my gosh, that I, was, what I did live there. Anyhow, um, so so that became a, a very interesting concept, and I gotta say, let the audience know that this there was no um, Facebook and there was no communication, and it was interesting at the time because the single emails back and forth between these hundred we didn't know if they were women, we didn't know anything about them at the beginning. We asked the question later; they were women. Uh, and, and, and we did ask celebrities too. Drew Barrymore, Macy Gray, Lila Ford, Jennifer, Jennifer Gardner was all, were all my customers and I asked them if they wanted to be a part of this and they could be anywhere uh, that, they, that they were. We have, and I still have each one of those vials that you made. There's probably 40 or 50 vials that we- Actually, I, I also wanna throw, I know you're on, a uh, but I wanna throw this in. Ron employed something that was, it's a, and I, I know it was consciously chosen to do, it's historically worked in marketing, but he, we literally told everyone, don't tell anyone you're doing this. Don't tell anyone you're a part of it. It's a secret. It's very exclusive. Do not tell anyone that you're a part of this development. And of course, as Ron predicted, they each told five friends who then contacted and say, I know I shouldn't know, but is there any way that I could try a sample? And it, you know, and I teach, um, sorry, I'm, I'm on a tangent, but I teach at FITM now. I teach the perfumery classes at FITM. And one of the 
things that I talk about is Francois Cody, who, you know, there's a, a story, there's two stories, like Chanel, Coco Chanel, when she was launching uh, Chanel number no. five, she did that. She, she developed it, made a hundred bottles and gave them as gifts at the hall, like just to her most exclusive clients and said, you'll never get them again. I'm never, I'm not, they're not for sale. And of course, then she had such overwhelming demand. She started selling it. Um, so anyway, yes, it's it, but I remember we were very clear in telling everyone, this is a very exclusive, very private thing. And, the, and I, it worked. I got emails. I got emails within a, a few days of, of these people signing on from the sister or the aunt or the cousin. And it said, I know I'm not supposed to know, but my sister's doing this. Could I, and it was, it was just fabulous. What I want to touch on though, with you is you mentioned, you know, here we are, we asked about, there were about 17 to 20 questions each time these, it, we delivered the samples out and, and, um, some of them were open-ended questions that we allowed people to talk about. Um, and we wanted to keep it just, and we asked some, some where question like, where would you, where would you put this fragrance? How would you wear it? What dress would you wear it with? And we let them expand on how do you feel when you wear this? And, and then there were plenty of um, uh, multiple choice questions. Well, I, I remember one, you taught me, you said, you know, um, when you ask the question, uh, what's fresh, my answer for fresh, your answer for fresh, and the others who are listening all have an expression of what's fresh, and it could be very different. We need to find out what that is. It's, so it's true. We asked, we asked by asking questions, and it was very detailed, and you, you, were, you were terrific on doing that. But we throw in some questions like, what, what fragrance do you remember? What is the fragrance? Or what is the scent you remember always? And it was, um, we gave them a multiple choice. It was a, a bakery at dawn, a sea breeze at sunset, uh, one other, and the scent of your lover. <laughs> you know, and, and it was, <laughs> You know, we got all, some interesting overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly the scent of your lover. <laughs> I don't remember. But here was the key to this was it was taking it was taking information and turning it into art. It was taking information and turning it into an object. It was what you do when you sit with somebody and you you ask them questions about how what they think so that you can make the fragrance and we did it as a group and it was a it was an interesting experiment and it worked i feel like um and you know you obviously know me and anyone that you know reads anything that i or has been experiencing what i do i do feel that you know as i started i felt that customization was really the only way to, to capture someone's essence in a bottle to really get that form of self-expression but as I've evolved over the years and worked with other people and, and obviously know as many of you do that your, your body chemistry is like your fingerprints, unique. And so any, even a ready to wear fragrance is gonna smell different from one person to the next. And it's really about finding the fragrance that connects with you, that really speaks to who you are and what, that really brings you into the moment and captures that form of yourself, that part of yourself that you want to share with people around you before you even say a word, they get a sense of who you are. I think that's my core belief about perfume. Um, really, you know, I always say as in life, so in perfume and, and really knowing who you are and being able to express it, I think is what we all as humans, especially now in this crazy time of COVID and, and all of us communicating in virtual ways, we just want to find a way to be heard, right? We just want to find a way to express ourselves. And I, I do believe that fragrance is an, it's, it's intimate, it's uh, personal, it's sub subjective, as we were talking, as you mentioned, Ron, um, you know, it's the only, it's the only physical sense that does not have its own 
unique language, right? So when we talk about fragrance, it's a sweet smell, but that's a taste adjective, or it's a soft smell, which is a touch adjective, or it's a green smell, which is a visual adjective. Really the only words that solely pertain to perfume are olfaction, silliage, like there's very few, the rest are borrowed. So because we cobbled together this borrowed language of perfumery of our personal experiences of how we experience scent, it does take almost an interpreter to understand when you say clean and fresh, and I say clean and fresh, where they meet. So I know that was a rambling moment there, but it is true. And bringing it back to if, like finding that and hearing from people and seeing where that common ground is of how many agreed this was a green scent or this was a, like the, that commonality of our collective experience and, and where that brings it in regards to fragrance was such an impactful experience for me with you and if, but also seeing the longevity of if, seeing how it still to this day is resonating with people and how people make it their own. Um, and something that I've always believed in, and, and I know you do as well, is uh, layering sense, because I know a lot of people wear if, but then could layer something with it to bring it that unique experience, and, but they love the signature of it. So. Um, yeah, I just went on a rambling tangent, but that's pretty right. much where I, that's where so, I'm at. So there's, it's very interesting because we have, we have now in, in Apothea, two different collaborations that just came to us from two different customers, uh, stores, and, and um, they wanted to pair if with another one of our fragrances as a, as a more signature for them. And would we start in that place? So it, it's absolutely true, that, that connection that you do. I wanted to, to, to just ask you, are you still doing personal fragrance creation for people today? I do. And, and how do you do it? How do you do it um, uh, across the United States or wherever they live, if I, maybe even across the world? Uh, how do you communicate that? Like this on a Zoom call? Well, yes, actually, we do a couple of different options. We have, and I even had back then something that I call the online journey, because what I do, the process of what I do, I call the fragrance journey. And, uh, you know, because when I meet with the clients about a two hour session, you can see my fragrance organ behind me, but we meet in front of the, you know, in times when we're actually able to meet in person, I we meet in person. And I do this two hour, very, um, you know, as, as anyone listening is kind of getting the idea already but i'll take it as far as you want to go you want to go deep spiritual psychological i am 100 percent there with you and i will pair that material with that deep spiritual focus or if you want to go super clinical and talk about the molecular structure the aldehyde and the ethyl you know phenyl ethyl alcohol i'll go there with you as well but i want to go i like to go deep so i charge more for that particular that one that that one in person but after that we do the um I have here in the studio, uh, we have a blending bar similar to what I had in Boston. Uh, and that, so the fragrance organ here has about 350 materials. Um, the blending bar, 125, and you meet with one of my senior, I have a staff that I've trained and taken years to train, and they meet with clients. And um, they do about an hour and a half session and also customization based on what I've taught, you know, my, my process, my, you know, going deep, sort of asking the questions, uh, pairing that with uh, emotion and olfactive experience, and they create a fragrance. And then we have the online journey, which is a questionnaire with a list similar to what we did, but also blank spaces where they can write in. And we, ought, we create three custom formulas, and they are truly custom. They are not oh, based on this, they want option A or that white floral over there. Like they, we take in each person's answers, create three unique formulas, send them samples, they evaluate, and then they either choose one or they could do a revision on that and they can set up an appointment uh, via, like, you know, via uh, computer or email. We'll do a revision before they choose their formula. I, I want to get a couple more. That's, it's really interesting. So you mentioned, a gardenia being a synthetic or a man-made piece one of the questions that always gets posed to me is are your fragrances not yours mine mm -hmm. <laughs> are they yeah are they no. all natural are they all yeah you know and how do you how do you 
approach that that question. Yes, let me talk to you about this. Okay, so first of all, nothing drives me more crazy than people that use the word natural as an adjective. It is not an adjective. So if something is natural, it means it connotates it. They're they're assuming it's an essential oil, and that definition is from a plant or a flower or an a extract from um, you know the the world, the natural world. Um, so feeling natural, that's different. But really, what people are looking for now is clean. So I work I work in what is termed in the in the perfumery world in what's called mixed media. So in other words, a blend of both naturals and synthetics. The synthetics are what we call now clean, and as you know, regulatory is constantly evolving. You're constantly having to change your materials. But uh, you can create things in a lab that are skin safe, non-allergen, you know, they, they're not creating allergens, um, and they don't have the, the, uh, the dirty component, you know, the parabens, the phthalates, the things that people aren't looking for, but are still give you a wider range olfactively. And then the naturals come from the natural world. So those are the, um, you know, rose absolute jasmine. I always think of them as the jewel that you're setting within the wider palette that some of the clean synthetics can give to broaden the, the conversation. But when people ask me, uh, you know, are your fragrances all natural? I'm very transparent. I say they are not all natural. They are a blend of clean synthetics and essential oils. And part of that is also the, um, you know, you want to, it's something people love like musks used to come from a deer, but we don't work with animal products. So you're not, you don't want to use a, uh, something that caused harm to an animal. So there are synthetic musks that are clean that you can use in perfumery to anchor a fragrance, give it longevity, and not be harmful to uh, the deer that musk used to come from. Right, and there's-, and there's, there's so I, I focus on that and sustainability also. Exactly. Like the, De deforestation that's happened with sandalwood, the um, environmental footprint, like all of the things that go into harvesting the naturals aren't always what's best for the environment. So I believe in, I love naturals. They are the cornerstone, the heart, the birthplace of perfumery, but I incorporate them into the mixed media part. Yeah, I read a, I read a, a, a piece once, I can't remember the author, but it was called Intelligent Synthetics. And it, yes. Well, yeah. just just on what you talked about about you know if you're if you're thought if you're thinking about the environment if you're thinking about harming or not harming things you know then then this man-made uh product the synthetics that we do are are really the answer because you don't want to hurt the forest you don't want to hurt we're, we're not going to hurt an animal for this but uh i i that's always because right now environment and naturalness is all on people's minds so that's why the question and comes up so yeah often. rightly so it's just re-educating because especially when we started together people made the assumption because the body shop for those of you who remember the body shop they anita roderick they sold oils and so everyone said oh my perfume is natural it's an oil it's an essential oil but it would be like cottonwood musk or unicorn tear you know musk or something and it's like it's 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 so clearly not from anything in the natural world but people want to believe if it's an oil so it's natural so there is a re-education that's happening and it's happening now i think people are learning people are much the consumer is so much more savvy now they're reading they're learning they're taking zoom classes um they're in fragrance groups online, which are huge and of the multitude. And of course, we've got Saskia leading the charge and killing it and bringing awareness and transparency to the, the perfume world. I mean, I think it's amazing. It's interesting you mentioned Body Shop. I just, I, I had to just throw this in very quickly. When I opened Apothea, my ethos was always as natural. I wanted, I wanted the most wonderful, pure product that I could get. And I would never, I never bought anything that was tested on animals. This is going back 35 years ago. And I didn't say anything because I just knew that that's my, that's the way I operate. And when Body Shop came out, they came out some years after and they flooded the market and their big deal was putting a big sign on everywhere they go we do not test on animals. 
and I learned something as a business person, and I'll, I, anybody else can learn this too right now. If you, if you have a, if you have an ethos, a belief, a direction, talk about it. If you're in business, because if you don't, somebody else is going to come out with a sign on their door and it's going to say, we do not test on animals. And the message it sends is everybody else does. Mm. But it's good. It does message. bring awareness. Saskia, I know we're running on time. Do you want to jump to questions? How are we? Tell us where you're at. Yeah, so I think now is a great opportunity to open it up to some questions from the community, if anybody has any. Uh, and if not, I, you know, I can. Sorry, we have a very loud truck going by, so I'm going to mute myself for one sec. Does anybody have any questions for, for Sarah and, and for Ron? Um, okay, Jasmine. Jasmine says, Sarah, thanks for your amazing story, so inspiring. Could you tell me what you think of the new IFRA regulations? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I love your name. How appropriate um, that you are a fragrance lover. It's my favorite fragrance. Jasmine is in the heart of everything that I wear personally. Um, I think IFRA is a moving target that makes me insane and is changing constantly and makes it extremely difficult for the small indie perfumer to keep up. Um, I think that we are all learning to adjust with it. Um, I know that there's a you know, it's a very, that's a very sticky question because there's, you know, fragrance houses on the board with IFRA and, and, and then like having to change your materials and change your formulations every 18 months when they have something new on the list. I think it's very challenging. Um, I obviously want to be safe. I want to be uh, learning, you know, if something is harmful. Obviously, we don't want to use it in our fragrances. But I do feel like uh, IFRA is constantly updating and it makes it very hard to keep up, keep up when you're buying your materials and you're working on a small scale. I hope that answers your question. I think that's a great answer, uh, very diplomatic. Um, I have a question actually for, for both of you, uh, Sarah and Ron. So, so since you guys are both sort of in it at the, at the dawn of digital, digital, you know, um, and obviously that's a big thing now. Have you, have you found uh, it difficult to adapt to the constant sort of new platforms? Like, you know, there's, there's Facebook, then there's in MySpace, Facebook, Insta no, wait, Friendster, MySpace, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, you know, uh, how do you guys engage with those platforms, you know, as, as they, at some point you say, okay, I give up or, um, and asking for a friend, no? <laughs> you want to take it, Ron? I'm going through this right now, so it's a very it's a very timely, and I've been going through it ever since. I, I mentioned that we started in 1998 or nine. I don't remember when 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 we got online, and I really thought of it as a uh, it, it, here's just a way to make extra money. I'm going to put it up there. If somebody buys it, I don't need a store. I'm going to take the order. We're going to fill the order. It's easy, and I I said it was nice. And today it is exactly what you said. It's we have to, com if you want to really succeed, you have to compete in a, in a similar manner that others are because there's, there's a person out there that does only um, figuring out how to, manu how to get your best oper operating uh, uh, advertising or whatever you're doing on Facebook. And then there's one for, for another place and it's it's constant and it's it's expensive too so it's not so it's not so easy i by the way i closed my retail stores last year i announced that after 42 years i wanted to have a change of life and and i did and we still have our our two online stores we redid apothea.com and we're redoing ron ron's um and i got to tell you it's we have so many conversations amongst us about this product, that product, what do we use? So if you're going to get in it, it takes, it takes the competitive edge to, to get those things done. And, and, um, and going through the list of who you have doing it is very important too, because now there's a number of people who tell you, I'm, you know, we, we do the best job at uh, Facebook, or we do the best job at, driving driving clients to your funnel and 
the the hardest thing for me and again i'm i'm from a different era but they're all talking in acronyms right <laughs> and there's That's true. there's That's so true. many acronyms going on and by the time they finish the sentence i have to have them stop and explain what they just said so. <laughs> I, I, I feel you on that. I have a theory that actually the, the next, and this is just my, my because this is what I hope, is I, th I have a theory that the next thing is going to be not, not sharing and, and going back to that sort of exclusivity that you uh, harnessed so well, Ron, you know, that like, don't tell anybody, because it does feel overwhelming and the competition is, is exhausting. I'm sure you guys feel that, you know. Yeah. Is there any, any I... thoughts on that? Well, I, I just want to say, and I know there's, I see a few more questions. I want you to, I want to address as many as I can, but just that I, I remember at the first awards, I've shared this with you before, when I, I uh, gave that first uh, award, I said, um, when I first started doing this and people would ask what I do, and I said, I'm a perfumer, I felt like I was speaking a foreign language and people thought I was insane. And now I feel like I can't like, you know, every day there's like five new you know people coming out launching a fragrance and oftentimes they're coming to me to which i'm grateful for don't get me wrong but it's like there's so much new all the time and uh keeping up with that and finding out when to say no and what really to focus on i think is critical go ask questions though i, I want to make sure anyone okay, that's so here i'm so grateful that you're joining us i want to make sure we get to everybody okay so ariana um and, and then we'll get caitlin and then rachel uh, Ariana says, asks, in a creative practice with smells, how is it to work as a curator or with art curators? Do you have any experience with that um, or sh memories to share? Is that to me or to uh, Ron? Uh, that's to you, I, I believe. Uh, so I think this is getting more into the realm of sort of olfactory art or exhibiting outside. Oh, of, yes. Of okay, so I can speak to that. Well, first of all, I, 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 again, when I started moving, when I first moved here, and if we had another hour, I could tell you some crazy stories, but I did pretty much anything that anyone would let me do in regards to fragrance, and I approached pretty much everyone with the idea of doing fragrance, and one of the first things I did in LA uh, while working with Ron was I met an artist that did an art installation downtown LA, and we had art pieces that, you know, an artist that was showing their work, there was lighting that went with each room, and I created a fragrance that was with each art piece in each room. And how I do that, and I think that how I still do that today is, uh, for me as an artist uh, who works in the medium of fragrance, uh, every emotion, everything has a scent. So if you talk to me in colors, then while you're talking about the blues and the turquoise, I see different materials. And when we talk about uh, reds, I'll see more of like the velvets, the ambers and the, and the more oriental notes. So I think that when you're working with artists and curating, it's really about, again, as in life, connecting with the emotion behind what that piece is trying to communicate and then pairing that olfactively with a uh, fragrance that speaks in that same way. Cool, I hope that helped Ariana. Um, okay, so Caitlin is asking both for Sarah and Ron, how did you, uh, both come up with the questionnaires for if uh, was there a big brainstorming session or uh, yeah was how did you do that i i based what my input to the questions was based on what i asked people in the fragrance journey so i had already been doing custom fragrances for so many years and i knew the key questions that really got people i always look at it like cracking a nut like how do you get into who what they really want and so I asked the basics, like, what's your favorite flower? What's your favorite time of day? Where would you live if you could be anywhere? Um, you know, how do you want to be perceived when you're wearing this fragrance? Like, I ask that in conversation when I'm working with clients. Um, and also, we, we did some wild card ones, right, Ron? Like, what texture against your skin? What, uh, again, what childhood memories, things like that. So that my contribution was based on my years of experience of interacting with personal so we had to take those now now we're we're t getting into the realm of taking the critical technical knowledge that you needed and making sure that the audience will respond to it now we're talking about 100 women and how do i keep them interested for eight months through this entire process and it was more of a opportunity to take the questions that that sarah had and then add some to add some texture to it, add some color to it, add some 
some humor to it so that we could we could mix it all up and keep everybody interested. It ended up, understand this is the beginning of the conversation of social media. There wasn't. People asked, is there any way we can communicate with anybody else in the group? But they were sitting in front of a screen for the first time and answering questions about interesting questions and deep themselves. And the open-ended questions allowed them to just expose it. There wasn't the conversation also about that out, out there that other people can hear you and see you and talk and, and get your information. That wasn't a part of the, the deal then. And everybody was opening up a lot. And the interesting part to me was then we would sit around the table and read these things amongst us to get information and turn it into a product. It would then drive the next group of questions. We'd always have to ask the basic questions of which, which one did you like best? How did you, did you mix them? Um, so it, it helped us focus on what was the consensus of all of the group, but we changed the questions around them each and every time. I have three books of pages this thick of each person's answer. Mm -hmm. We've We've gone through it and, and we, we learned what everybody, a hundred women's favorite color was. Now you would, you would figure that it might be pink, it was blue. And that was, that was a, it was just odd and interesting that that would be the one. But we learned all of those kind of things in 1999. Uh, to make this from these questions that we asked. Okay, um, so I'm going to end this with one question, one more question, and and then we'll have to call it a day. But um, and Rachel, I'm sorry we can't get to yours, but I'll I'll, uh, I'll ask Sarah and email you. But so Jory asks um, for for both of you if you could share some thoughts on trends that you're seeing in niche perfumery, uh, business industry trends, trends in popularity, etc. And then with that, we'll 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 come to a close. So. Ron, you want to start? Sure. Um, it, it's, a, it's a terrific question because I started in the apparel fashion business and, and fragrance was a, was a artistic uh, desire to, to I, I loved all the parts of it. I didn't know that fragrance was going to be trend driven as fashion is driven. Maybe not on the same point of view as fashion is, but for example, when we came out with our home, home collection of, of fragrance candles, one of them was called Spiritual. This was, uh, this was 12 years ago, Fit maybe, maybe a few more, maybe 15 years ago. It wasn't one of our best selling fragrances at the time. It was a woody, smoky, incense -y type of fragrance. Um, today, and we watch the trend of that peak and, and, and go towards a peak. And we're watching, you know, fresh and, and citrusy fragrances change. So fragrance does have a trend. Today, I'm seeing a lot more of this desire for incense -y, woody, um, spicier uh, home fragrance. Fragrances, and I, 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 I'm going to say it in, in, in context of a home fragrance. Um, we certainly saw the, the transition from the oud fragrances about, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago. I remember I mean, it that. So it's nuts. It's crazy. And, uh, Fantol, you know, so, of course, took over everything. Yeah. So uh, it, it definitely has a trend. Sarah, where do you think it's, where do you think it is or going or? It, well, how? it's interesting. I think, I think um, Saskia kind of hit it on the head already. I think where are we currently, you know, we're, we're moving from the natural to the clean. I think transparency 100% is here to stay and going to continue to be critical in, in regards to the new, what people are looking for. They want to, they want to know what's behind the scenes. I think that's why it makes this such an interesting time is that, and something I never saw when I started, but I'm so grateful it's here now is people actually want to see who's making the sauce, what goes into the sauce. 
Um, my dad's watching, so I could tell you garlic, <laughs> lots of garlic, but you know, you've got that, you have that experience where um, people want to know what's happening. So I think what's happening coming forward is uh, a continued desire for authenticity. And I think a continued desire to know who is making it, what it's made from. I, I think it's going to be less about it has to come from the natural world. It has to be 100% natural. More as I, I have to know it's not doing harm to the environment and it's not harming me. That trend is not going anywhere. I think customization, although I've been doing it 30 years, may I think more and more people are looking for ways to individualize. And so we're, we're almost there. The technology is almost there uh, to really be able to assist in that. I think maybe that'll come. I think more and more people are really looking though for ways to communicate their experience through fragrance. And I think we're seeing more and more opportunities for them to do that with the materials and the communication that are around today in the modern perfumery world. Well, Ron, thank you so much. Thank you so well, thank much you, for everything, for 30 years and then some and for today. And for Saskia, before we, go, to and before we have to sign off, I got to give a shout out, um, well, to my parents and to my aunt for showing up today. I love you so much. But also to Saskia Wilson-Brown for, oh. um, I've been <laughs> since the beginning of this and that you have been at the forefront of transparency and you've given a platform you know, I, it's one thing if I was speaking into a megaphone, but if there was no one here, it didn't mean anything. And so you are a pioneer and I am grateful for what the work you do as well. So all of you guys, thank you so much for showing up today. Please stay safe and clean and healthy and expressing yourself olfactively. Love yourself. Go. So oh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Ron. Uh, and back at you, Sarah. Thanks, and back at you, Ron. Yeah, so everybody, thank you so much for joining. We're going to be scheduling more of these. Uh, Sarah and Ron are fantastic people, as you can tell, and it was nice to spend time with them just on a personal, selfish level. Thanks to everybody, and uh, to Sarah's mom, dad, and aunt, thank you for raising such a cool girl. She's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Love you, Sarah. I love, love you, you guys. Thank, thank you. you. This was so thank fun. You. Bye. <laughs>